Church, in the month of August, we've been talking about Psalms. And it is not a sermon series for us to be aware of all Psalms. Even if we were to preach about Psalms every day, every, yeah, really, every Sunday, we would need years to go over all the Psalms that we have. There's 150. You cannot preach about them on one year. Not even if you preach twice in a Sunday. So our attempt is not to tell you all the things that you need to know about each of the Psalms, but what our attempt is to tell you what you need to know to the Psalms, period, as a group of books in the Bible. So one thing that I want you to realize of Psalms is that Psalms can be Psalms of praise, individual or community lament, songs of trust, songs of thanksgiving, of leadership, wisdom, pilgrimage, liturgy. This is important because not all the psalms are the same. Walter Brueggemann, which is a professor of theology in Columbia Seminary, wrote a, psalm, uh, a book of the psalm called Praying the Psalms. And in this book, Brueggemann says that there are two basic movements in life. You are either inside of the pit or you're outside of the pit. Either you're having a good time or you're having a terrible time. That's it. And, you know, he's very drastic in that, but I see his point. And he uses these two movements in life to say that there are three types of psalms. The first one is orientation. The second one is disorientation. The third one is reorientation. And today, the psalm that we are about to read, Psalm 80, which, by the way, I recommend that you take your cell phone out or your Bible if you brought it, and read along with us because it's, it's confusing and not an easy psalm to read. I bet you that most of you have not read it before. But Psalm 80 is a psalm of disorientation, and we will see why. Let us begin with verse 1. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, who lead Joseph like a flock, you who are enthroned upon the cherubim, shine forth. Before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh, stir up your might and come to save us. Now beginning in verse 8. You brought a vine out of Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it. It took deep root and filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shade. The mighty cedars with its branches. It sent out its branches to the sea and it shoots to the river. Why then have you broken down its walls? So that all who pass along the way pluck its fruit? The boar from the forest ravages and all that move in the field feed on it. Turn again, O God of hosts. Look down from heaven and see, have regard for this vine. The stock that you right hand planted, they have burned it with fire. They have cut it down. May they perish at the rebuke of your countenance. They have burned it with fire. They have cut it down. May they perish at the rebuke of your continents. But let your hand be upon the one at your right hand, the one whom you made strong for yourself. Then we will never turn back from you. Give us life, and we will call on your name. Restore us, O Lord God of hosts. Let your face shine that we may be safe. Friend of what I one question I want you to start thinking about this Psalm, Psalm 80, is from where does my help come from? Now, verse 1 and 2 of the scripture that we read today begins talking about God the shepherd of Israel. Then thrown upon the cherubim, Ephraim, Benjamin, and Manasseh. Then it says, Stir up your might and come to save us. Verse 1 and 2 is a greeting from the psalmist, which, by the way, is not David. You know how joy leads worship here? 
and she sings. Well, David had a person like joy. If I were to be David, joy would be the director of the Psalms. This Psalm 80 was written by joy in times of David. Asaph is what we know him for. It was a director of the psalmist music. And the psalmist wrote this song. This is not a psalm from David. This is a psalm from the director of music of David. And the director of music saying, You are the shepherd of Israel. You are enthroned upon the cherubim. Which, by the way, cherubim is an angel. There are two types of angel. A seraphim and a cherubim. A seraphim is the first higher rank of angels. According to the Old Testament, they are the ones that go into the world to carry God's message. Those are the angels that often talk to people of God or brought news of God. The cherubim had a different identity. They were second in rank, but their job was to worship God 24-7. These are the angels that you and I will see in heaven when we go and declare God's glory forever and ever, every single minute of our existence in God, which is what we will do in heaven. And thrown upon the cherubim talks about how God is worthy of every praise. And thrown upon the cherubim talks about how in the temple, how in Noah's Ark, how in the covenant and the um, Ark of the Covenant, the cherubims were going before because everything is of worship of God. Ephraim, Benjamin, and Manasseh were tribes of the northern kingdom who were in trouble. I believe the psalmist wrote Psalm 80 when they were in the midst of the battles of the northern tribes. And they were scared. Imagine you are in a boat or in a car. And the car or the boat is sinking. And the water is rising, rising. And your water is just filling you and you're just declaring God's glory. Come, come, God, I'm about to die. You're not dead yet, but you feel death coming. You feel death knocking at the window. So Ephraim, Benjamin, and Manasseh were three tribes out of all the tribes of Israel who were particularly in danger. And the psalmist says, stir up your might and come to save us. Then, let us move to verse 8, 9, 10, and 11. This is what it says. You brought a vine out of Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted. You cleared the ground for it. It took deep root and filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shade. The mighty cedars with its branches. It sent out its branches to the sea, and it shoots to the river. What is this about? Obviously, the psalmist is bragging about all the things that God has already done. Verse 1 and 2 is the psalmist calling out to who Jesus, God, and the Holy Spirit is. You are the shepherd. You are our salvation. The three tribes need you. Come, stir up your might, and come and save us. It's like when you write a letter, if you do those things. I know it's old school, but sometimes you write a letter. The first thing that you do is a greeting. If you're going to ask for a favor of your favorite aunt or grandma, you tell them, I remember when you used to hold me and give me this, and you start, you know, coozing. It's like when my son wants something, and you see how he's walking and looking at me, smile. He hugs me first and says, Papi, can I have the iPad? And I say, what did your mom say? And he says, Daddy can have the iPad? <laughs> because you know what they're doing, and you, they think they're so smart, and you're like, yeah, I smell you. I know what you want. So I think here the psalmist is bragging about all the things that God has done. You brought out a vine out of Egypt. It doesn't mention the 40 years of the wilderness. No, it's only bragging about the cool stuff, the good stuff, like most people do when they're about to ask for a favor. The Psalms are often directions of the events of the people of God through music. 
It also reflects on people. Do you have examples in your life that you wish to follow? Heroes of the like? Not heroes in TV, but your uncle, your cousin that really made it. And that's like, man, that's a good example to follow. Did you know that also in our families and our, among our friends, there are examples of what not to do? Examples or warnings of what not to do? The Psalms can be also like that. It's a little bit like this. Is there a song in your heart that when you listen to it, it makes you happy? I hope you say yes. Everybody deserves a good tune in their hearts. But is there also a song that will drive you into sadness? A song that remembers a failed love or a broken relationship? I hope that you have also experienced that. For no other reason that they say that you have to know what is salty to really appreciate the sweets. The Psalms are just like that. Is there a special Psalm from the Bible that talks about how wonderful God is? Yes. Think about Psalm 23. How God brings you to still waters. Comforts your soul. Defends you when you're facing your enemies. And gives you rest. And then there are psalms like this that really are depressing. Why? Because of verse 12a. Then why you have broken down the walls? This is how the psalmist did it. It's cozy. Verse 1 and 2. You're wonderful. Verse 8, 9, 10, 11. Look at all the things that you have done. And then verse 12 is like, why then? We are divine. You brought us out of Egypt. We were defended by this wall. And now that you have brought the wall down. Why? When you were so nice before, why you have brought this thing that brought protection? And the one thing I want you to know about this verse is that nowhere in, the, in Psalm 80, God talks. It's only the psalmist. So when the psalmist says, why then have you broken our walls? Think about God saying, who says I did? Defends you when you're facing your enemies and gives you rest. And then there are psalms. That was not planned. <laughs> and that was creepy hearing myself. <laughs> I was like, really? I didn't know God sounded like this. <laughs> Woo. <laughs> Think about how the psalmist assumes that the wall is down, that the protection is down. Obviously, the psalmist feels that something is wrong. But there are also other things that the psalmist is not aware that are about to happen. It's obvious to me that the psalmist is inside of the pit. The psalmist knows what is going on in their world. Is depressed. He's inside of the hole and feels that there is no escape. If we were to put the psalmist in one situation, he will say he's deep down in his trouble. So he thinks God has broken down the walls of protection. The psalmist is preaching about how disoriented he is. Have you ever been like that? Draw from your memory. Have you ever felt forgotten by God, that God is not walking next to you? That you feel that you just want to say yada, 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 which means in Hebrew, why, why, why? That's what's happening. The Psalm 80 that we're reading right now is a psalm that is educating us about how we can talk to God when we'll feel lost. Have you ever heard the story of the, wall, of the wallet? My story of the wallet? There are particular stories in your life that you need to retell because every time that you tell the story, 
Even if others will say, well, I already heard that story, Mario. It teaches you something new. Back in the year 2002, I was in Ohio at a church camp. We're going to beat ups, Buffalo Wild Winds, which is a wings place. And uh, we're having fun with the staff. And in my wallet, I have my visa, my passport, my credit card, the cash that Gina, my mother, gave me, and everything else that has any value on me. I'm wearing it. I'm putting it on my, my pocket. I eat wings, maybe too many wings. When we leave and I'm about to go pay, I know that my wallet is not there. Of course, I had a conversation with my brother, and he says, Mario, didn't my mom tell you not to put everything in one place? Didn't she say to put the passport and the visa on the suitcase? Didn't she say not to put the credit card and the cash in the same place? I was about to get in a fist fight with Omar. That's when Reverend Ed took me on the side and said, Mario, let's, let's chat. Let's go to the house. And we talked and says, hey, Mario, everything will be okay. I know you are scared right now, but we will help you. We will find a new passport. We will do, you know, we know that you're in limbo right now because you cannot go back to Colombia and you really don't have a legal status here with a point of entry. You're in limbo. And you know we don't have, you don't have cash or your credit cards, but we will give them to you. We, we will help you. Everything will be fine. And we prayed, and I left. As I was driving my Gator, which is, uh, you know, it's a really cool, like a golf car, but on steroids. You know, it has six wheels, and you can go through mud. It's really cool. I still have the key, by the way. And there's a place called Bunker Hill. And in Bunker Hill, there is a cross. And I stopped the car there, and I told, God, I need my wallet back. And I need it now. You need to give it to me. I have no place to go. Please. No, no, please. You need to give it to me. I jumped in the golf car after prayer, and I drove to the house where I was staying at the camp, and I slept. That was Saturday. Sunday came. Nothing happened. Monday, as I was having breakfast, Ed said, hey, here's your wallet. Somebody found it and dropped it off. They dropped it off yesterday, but I was busy and I couldn't bring it to you right away. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Which one is the miracle of the story? Is it that I found the wallet? No. The miracle of the story is that on that day where I was full of pain and concern, I could draw, drive, and go home and go to sleep. I didn't call my mother. I didn't call my father. I didn't get in a fist fight with my brother. I just simply was at peace. And I imagine God saying, oh, you're mad. <laughs> well, you should have listened to your mother. That's why I gave it to you. Really? You're going to yell at me? You're going to show your fist? Who are you to yell at me like that? But fine, I will entertain you. Your wall is in the way back. I have sent an angel to go pick it up and drop it off. But don't make a habit of it. How many, you know how many times I lost my wallet? Yeah, more than five times. And every single time I found it. Yeah. So, in moments of trouble, we see God in a way. Now, you don't know this part either, but I discover that it was the same story of pain that Reverend Adler used to make me aware of my call into ministry. He said, Mario... You could have just drive home. You could have just simply go to sleep because I told you I was going to fix it all. But you decided to take a detour and go to Bunker Hill and go talk to God like he was a real God. Not a God that's on the clouds. Not a God that you are afraid of. But he was so real to you like you were demanding your wallet back and God sold your faith. 
and rewarded you with peace while it was just icing on the cake. I believe the psalmist was in my position. And the Psalm 80 is there to show you how is it that you can talk to God, to identify that God is real. God is not simply just of the clouds. God is a real thing. When was the last time that you talked to God like you were talking to another person? Another person that has the way to solve your problems. That is what Psalm 80 is teaching us here. I say this is because you cannot read Psalms individually. You have to read the Psalms in cahoots with other Psalms. Pay attention to what Psalm 121 says. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time and, say it with me. Forevermore. Say it with me again. Forevermore. Does that sound like the God that will bring a wall, uh, a wall down? Make that decision for yourself. What do you know about God? What if... Have you ever heard the story of David and Uzzah? One of the generals of David. The people of God had a tribe called the Levites. And the Levites were the only people that were supposed to be carrying the Ark of the Covenant. And as they walk in, Uzzah realizes that the Ark of the Covenant is going to go down. And Uzzah comes to the rescue and catches it before it falls down. And God kills him. Just like that. David is so mad. Why? Because I told you not to touch the Ark of the Covenant. But why? Because I told you not to touch it. It's holy. Why? Because I am God. And David was mad. And then a few chapters later, David says, I am nobody to be mad at you, God. So in the understanding of how God does things, we need to understand that our understanding is not the same as God. We are like this as human beings. Look at what verse 18 says. Then we will never, never turn back from you. Really? What a bunch of lies. I mean, have you read what happens after Psalms? And what ha continues to happen after the holy book is written? Have you seen what happens in our day-to-day -day things? And we will never turn back back from you. Give us life and we will call on your name. Again, it's like my child making promises that he cannot keep. Oh, I will be good. If you give me that piece of chocolate, I will always listen to you. I will never cry. What a bunch of lies. <laughs> Why do we do this? Why do we put our trust in something. Call it a wall. Call it money in the bank. Call it anything. For me, is my strength. I'm not kidding. I had records of strength in high school. But how far does strength go when it goes away? For the people who are older than I, don't our strength goes away? And the they dumbbell of 120 I could lift, I cannot lift that anymore. My shoulder is messed up because of the why. Consider that perhaps God wanted to bring that wall down. Why? Look at the picture. If you have a vineyard and the vineyard is expanding, does the wall protect you? Or is keeping you from growing? Sometimes we believe that those things that protect us are the ones that actually are taken away from us. See, I was always so strong, but I didn't rely on the strength of God. You're so smart, but do you rely on the knowledge of God? 
Are you so compassionate by your own demise, by your own account, that you don't trust in God? This is where I want you to start thinking, what is the purpose of the wall? This is what I believe is happening. The psalmist is inside of the pit, and the psalmist is disoriented, but he's about to be reorientated by the mercies of God. I told you that Ed, Reverend Ed, used the story of my wallet to say, Mario, you can be a successful lawyer or you can be a pastor. Why did you take the detour? You couldn't just go home and sleep. But you took the detour to talk about something that most people say is just in the clouds. You saw how real God was. You had a conversation with God. And you're alive to tell the story. It's a story worth telling. I think God has a way to reorient it, our desires. So the next time that you feel that walls are down and that you are unprotected, are you really going to trust a wall to protect you? Or are you really going to trust the one that planted the vineyard, the one that built the wall to save you? And where do you find your hope of salvation? Is it on a physical thing or is it in the God that is eternal that promised you forevermore? Amen.